Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Mr. Cox back in the lab again today. Um, this for today's video. This might be a bit of a long one. We're going to go over one of probably the most important fundamental concepts in chemistry, which is why and how do atoms bond together? So chemical bonding. Okay, so before we start, there's a really, really key important question we want to think about. Why do atoms bond together in the first place? Why don't they just go around on their own? Because some of them do. If you take uh, your group eight elements, so helium and things like that, they do go around their own. But nearly everything else would much rather be stuck to something. Why do they do that? So our starting point, the reason atoms bond together, they want to become more stable. They are more stable when they have a full outer shell. So anything except for group eight in the periodic table won't have a full outer shell. And therefore, if it can bond to something else, and by doing that, achieve a full outer shell, and there's more than one way I can do that, um, it will do so and become more stable, and therefore that's why they bond together. So their motivation, if you like, is to get a full outer shell. Okay, in this video, we're gonna talk about three main types of bonding. There is kind of a fourth, but we're not gonna cover that in this video. So, our three types of bonding. You have something called ionic bonding. So, hopefully, if you watch some of my other videos, you know what an ion is. An ion is a charged particle. Okay, so we'll talk about that in a bit. Uh, ionic bonding happens when you have metals bonded to non-metals. Okay, so if you've got a chemical such as, let's pick the poster child of this type of thing, um, sodium chloride, table salt, NaCl, Na stuck to Cl, that's ionic, you've got a metal bonded to a non-metal, okay? And we'll talk about how they do that in a second. Second type of bonding, I put it covalent, but this is going to be talking about simple covalent bonding. There is another type of covalent bonding called giant um, covalent structures, um, things like diamond, we're not going to do that today, we're only going to cover simple covalent molecules, okay? Covalent bonding happens when you have non-metals. So, good example would be the oxygen in the air that you are breathing. That is a covalent body bonded chemical. Oxygen and oxygen, they're the same thing, but they're both non-metals. Finally, you've got metallic bonding. And hopefully, by process of elimination and from the name, you can probably guess, metallic bonding happens between metals. Okay, so what we'll do now, we'll um, have a quick look at some of the properties of these things. So I'll uh, do some little demonstrations. Um, then we'll go back and see if we can explain why those properties exist based on how it must bond together. Okay. Okay, so here we have some classic ionic compounds. So we've got sodium chloride. Look, I'll show you the label. Uh, otherwise known as table salt. So you all know what that looks like. Uh, it's crystals. So if I pour a big pile there, you all know what sodium chloride looks like. It's white crystals. Uh, Here's another one, copper sulfate, another salt. This is an ionic compound. Um, coppers, sulfurs, and oxygens in that compound. Um, I've also got some larger crystal here to show you. So just to show you, all ionic compounds are crystalline. So if I hold them up, you can see they actually form some quite funky crystal shapes. So these ones tend to form, what would you call that? Is that a rhombus, maybe, or a parallelogram? I'm not sure, but they have particular shapes. Another key thing, if I put it near the camera again, I can crack it. It's brittle. So these are not opposite of malleable these are brittle they break very very easily so two properties already of ionic compounds that are crystalline and they are brittle okay we're then going to show you a couple of other properties so that way for this one monster uh let's uh, fire up the bunsen over here so safety flame now one thing people seem to think is they know that salt dissolves, so I won't show you, but if I put that in some water, it would quite obviously dissolve. They therefore think that it will come apart really easily. So if you ask somebody, oh, does salt melt? They tend to think, well, yeah, of course it does. They'd be wrong, of course. So, Bunsen. You probably can't see the flame very easy. We're on the roaring flame now. If I hold that to my salt, I might get some funky orange effects. Remember, the uh, roaring flame, we're about 400 degrees. Is it doing anything at all to my salt? The answer is absolutely not. I could sit there with the flame on it all day. It's not going to do anything. I need to get that twice as hot as this Bunsen can manage in order to melt that. So, salt doesn't melt. All ionic compounds have very high melting points. That's one of their key properties. Okay, guys, so I've zoomed in a little bit now. We've got... Um, 
This is my sodium chloride. I poured a load into a beaker. Uh, this is just good old water, H2O. What type of bonding is that? Well, we know hydrogen and oxygen are both non-metal, so that's covalent bonding. So we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But what we're going to use this uh, little uh, bit of equipment for is to just demonstrate two other properties, one of which I've already told you about. So if we just check off what we already know, we know that they have high melting points. I can't easily melt that salt, remember? It's just not going to go. The melting point is very high. All other compounds, high melting points. We know that they are crystalline. Remember our coxophic crystals. Um, and they're brittle. They snap easily. Okay. Two other properties. So, first one. In fact, actually, before I do anything, uh, off screen here, you probably see it's power pack. Just turned it on, plugged up to a little bulb over here. Uh, here's my two wires just to show you. I've made the circuit when I put these two things together. Light goes on. Okay, so we've got a circuit. Okay, do ionic compounds conduct? Well, the answer is a bit more, a bit more complicated than just yes or no. So if I stick my two electrodes in there, whoop, without getting the wire cut, cool, you can probably see the light bulb is definitely not going on. Therefore, we could say that they don't conduct, but there is a bit more to it than that. So, take my same salt, gonna pour it all in this water, and as we know. A lot of ionic compounds do dissolve in water, not all, but one property of them is some of them do dissolve. Okay, so we know that good old table salt sodium chloride does dissolve. So I have now made a salt solution. So it's still sodium chloride, it is just dissolved. If I now take my electrodes again, look at my light bulb, if I stick them in. Ta da! So, two key properties we've now shown. First of all, some, not all, but some ionic compounds will dissolve. Also, ionic compounds, when they are dissolved, or if you do heat them up enough that they are molten, they will also conduct electricity, which shows us there must be some kind of charged particle that is able to move um, if it's dissolved or it's molten. Because if you, to have electricity flow, you've got to have charged particles that are moving. So, we've seen our key properties. Brittle, high melting points, some dissolve, uh, form crystals, um, in no particular order, uh, conduct when molten or when um, dissolved. So what we now need to do is build a model that explains this. Okay, look. Okay guys, so back at the board, I've got a few different pictures here which I'm gonna to use to try and explain to you how the properties of ion compounds are, are the way they are because of the structure at smaller scale. So. Let's just remember what we know. Ionic bonding between the metal and our metal, and we've discovered some of these properties. How can we explain them? So first of all, let's think back to why these things are bonding together. They're trying to get a full outer shell. So, sodium is in group one, therefore it has one electron in the outer shell. So 11 electrons in total, one in the outer shell. It wants to lose that electron. Chlorine, 17. So, outer shell has seven, it's in group seven. It wants to get a full shell. For chlorine, rather than losing seven, it will be easier to gain one. And hopefully now you start to see, oh, these two are going to get on, aren't they? Sodium wants to lose an electron. Yes, it does. Chlorine wants to gain an electron. Well, why doesn't the chlorine just take the electron from the sodium? And that's exactly what happens in ionic bonding. Ionic bonding is the give and take of electrons. Okay. Why is it called ionic? Because if this loses an electron, it's still got 11 protons, it's now only got 10 electrons, meaning it will be left with a charge of plus one. Chlorine, 17 protons, 17 electrons. If it takes that extra electron, it'll have one more electron than it does protons, and therefore an overall of a charge of minus one. These things are now charged particles, and remember the definition of the word iron is a charged particle. So these things are now charged. That's why they stick together. So the very basics of ionic bonding are you have plus and minus charged particles because one has lost electrons, one has gained electron, and opposite charges want to stick together. And that's what holds these chemicals together, is the electrostatic charge. Right, so, we've got a plus one, we've got a minus one, electrostatically they want to stick together. However, it's not just one and one, you don't just have one sodium and one chlorine and they stick together. What happens is they build together to form a much larger structure. So if we, this is my diagram to attempt to insert, that obviously this is in 2D, in reality in 3D. What we've effectively got here is the purple is representing our sodium ions that we know have a charge of plus one. Our chlorines have a charge of minus one because they've taken an electron. Plus and minuses want to stick together, that's called electrostatic attraction. What you therefore find happening is 
a positive ion will want to surround itself with negative ions and vice versa and therefore what they do is stack together in this very 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 ordered structure and it's not just a few it would be an uncountably large number so if you think of one salt crystal that's big enough for you to see therefore in chemistry sense that's massive giant in fact that is an uncountably large number of these ions all stuck together in a very ordered pattern and it has to be a very ordered pattern because pluses want to be near negative but not near other pluses and therefore they stack together and that is called your giant ion lattice does that now explain some of our properties well, yes it does the crystal is a giant organized structure remember they, i showed you the copper sulfate crystals and they had a very particular shape that's because the ions stack together in a very particular shape um, if you ever look at a sodium chloride normal table sort crystal on a microscope um, they're cubic because they stack together very much imagine this in 3d that's exactly how they stack together and therefore you get a cube why are they brittle well if you think about this sort of this diagram now what would happen if i applied a bit of force and i shuffled that top layer just across a little bit you'd have a situation where pluses are now next to pluses and minuses are next to minuses and in the same way that opposite charges attract like charges repel Therefore, they push apart and the whole structure shatters. It's brittle. It shatters because you basically misaligned those ions. If they're not in the right place, you've lost the attraction. Instead, you've gained a plus and a plus pushing apart or a minus minus pushing apart and the whole thing shatters. So we know they're crystals. We know they're brittle because our structure shows us it's going to be brittle. OK, why they have high melting points is actually a very easy one. So think of all that all heat really is, is a measure of how much these particles are vibrating so in this structure these things are going to be wobbling next to each other what you've got to do to melt it is effectively wobble it enough that those particles overcome the attraction between the plus and the minus which is called our electrostatic force electrostatic forces are very very strong and therefore in order to get enough movement to pull those apart is a very high temperature and therefore all ionic compounds have very high melting points because it is hard to break an ionic bond because electrostatic forces are very strong. Um, if you have ions that have got bigger charges, so obviously we've got here a group one and a group seven, if you have something like magnesium oxide where you've got plus two and minus twos, they hold together even stronger because the bigger the charges, the more they want to hold together. So this mounts, um, table salt mounts at about 800 degrees, magnesium oxide is oh, well over a thousand and the higher the charges, the higher the melting points. Okay. Why does it conduct when dissolved? If you do, pull, or molten I should say, if you do pull those things apart, you now have charged particles. If you therefore apply a voltage, i.e. plug it up to a circuit, because opposite charges attract, what you will find is the positive ions will want to move towards the negative electrode and vice versa. You have moving charged particles. That's what electricity is. So the reason this conducts when molten or dissolved is you've got charged particles, ions we should call them that can move when it's solid you've got charged particles but they're locked in place they can't move which is why it'll only conduct when molten or dissolved okay last little thing i need to show you something called a dot cross diagram now there are two types of dot cross diagram there is one for ionic compounds which we're talking about now and there is one for covalent compounds so don't get in your head though it's just one thing there are two types of diagrams i always remember the ionic one is the one with square brackets okay what we're doing here is showing this structure after the electrons have moved from one to another. So that's what they look like to start with. How do you draw them to show the bonding? So without having to do sort of anything fancy, so you only show one of each ion. So what we effectively do, in Dr. Osram, you draw only the outer shell and you draw them as they are after the electrons have moved. So sodium, you might be thinking, well, hold on, there's no outer shell in there, Mr. Cox. Reason being, chemistry, we tend to be lazy. What we're basically saying with this one, we get rid of that electron, we have got to fill our shell, but the other way of interpreting it is that actually the outer shell is empty. We're going to go with that one because it involves these drawings. So therefore, my outer shell is empty, I don't need to draw anything. The square brackets are a way of saying, I'm an ion, I'm a charged particle. And up to the top there, you put its charge. And in this case, it's a charge of plus one because it's just going to lose that one electron. So it is a plus one ion. Again, in chemistry, you could put a one there, um, we tend not to bother. If it's just a plus, it means plus one. If it was plus two, you'd have to write plus two. The chlorine, come to this side. Do it. Chlorine, it's out of shell. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven of its own electrons. Those are shown by the crosses. So it's got seven electrons because it's in group seven. We know it has seven electrons. It also now has an extra one to show that it came from somewhere else. In this case, the sodium. 
we do it as a dot. So seven crosses, one dot. Still got its full shell of eight. Again, square brackets to show that it's a charged particle, it's an ion, and its overall charge is now a minus because it's got one more electron that should have, same number of protons, therefore when you do the tally, it balances out as being one negative. So the metals always form your positive ions, your non-metals always form your negative ions. In this case, a plus one and a minus one. So that's called an arnic dot cross diagram. It's a way of showing the bonding where you just show, you're showing one of each and what would happen. Obviously, in reality, they would stack together as trillions and trillions and trillions of them. Okay, so just a quick reminder then, what have we covered today? So far in just ionic bonding, we've looked at the properties of them. You need to remember those properties. You could easily get a question that makes you explain the properties um, using the underlying science, in which case, hopefully we've done that. We've talked about their structure before um, they give and take electrons. Remember, the key thing is it's give and take of electrons. Metals lose electrons. Non-metals take them, metals become positive ions, chlorine or any non-metal will become a negative ion, and they stick together because plus and minus attract, it's called an electrostatic force, and they're very strong. And we've also then covered what they look like in 3D, and what they look like, how we draw them at a smaller scale. So, that's the main type of bonding so far we've covered, we've got two more to do. I did say this might be quite a long video. So, next up, covalent bonding. Next up, covalent molecules. Now, in this case, um, I'm not going to have to show you them because they're all around you. So, if you think of the main gases in the air around you, you've got lots of nitrogen, you've got oxygen, you've got a little bit of CO2. All of those things are covalent molecules, simple covalent molecules. So, we already know some of the properties. Always about. Uh, we always know some of the properties they're around us. Therefore, those things are all gases. Therefore, they have already boiled. So, well, melting points and boiling points for covalent chemicals are very, very low. Okay. okay, I'll remind you there is a big exception about these things called giant covalent structures. We're not covering that in this video. So, simple covalent molecules, they've all got low melting and boiling points. Um, they also don't conduct well. So, they're not good conductors of electricity or heat, actually. So, um, uh, covalent chemicals tend to not conduct. Um, if you have something made of a covalent chemical, it won't tend to conduct heat through it very easily. Um, that's why if you're wearing a coat in the winter, it has lots of trapped air. That's why you have layers between your clothing, because we know that air is a rubbish conductor. It doesn't conduct well, because simple covalent molecules don't. Okay, so they don't conduct, they've got no charged particles, so they can't conduct electricity. They don't conduct heat well either, and they have very low melting and boiling points. Let's now explain why. So first of all, we're going to do this kind of the other way around this time. We're going to go straight to a dot cross diagram to try and explain the bonding. So in this case, nitrogen is N2. It's one nitrogen bonded to another. So whereas an ionic compound, we were sort of thinking they'd be one giant structure. These things are simple. They're just a handful of things bonded together. In this case, just two. So each nitrogen has one, two, three, four, five electrons. because it's in group five, so that's what it is. Um, what they do, in dot cross diagrams and uh, covalent chemicals, importantly, there's no give and take of electron here. There is no way you could have two nitrogens and one give electrons to the other and then be happy. Neither, they wouldn't end up with both the full out shells. Therefore, they do something different, they share. So, how you show that in this diagram, where they overlap is the electrons that are being shared. So, nitrogen, and look at this, so this side I've used the crosses, this side I've used the circles. So it's got one, two, three, four, five electrons of its own. It's trying to get to full shell of eight. So it shares three, you share as many as you need in order to get your full out shell. This nitrogen obviously does the same. It shares three and it's got two left over. If you then sort of um, work that out, so this nitrogen, one, two, three, four, five of its own, plus three that's shared, gets it to its eight, it's full out of shell. This nitrogen is of course the same. This is called a triple bond because we are sharing three electrons. Um, if I was to draw a different one very quickly, I'm underneath I'll quickly draw oxygen. So oxygen has, draw a bit smaller, group six of six electrons. So this one I need to share two, one, two, and therefore the other four go somewhere else. So it's only got six. On this side I'll do dots, so it shares two, the other two go elsewhere. Overall though, one, two, three, four, five, six of its own plus two shared gets you up to eight. Six of its own plus two shared gets up to eight. So this one will be a double bond. Another way of showing these is what's called a stick and ball diagram. So a quicker way of doing it, there's your triple bond. Each line represents a, shared, a, pa a pair of shared electrons. Oxygen has a double link between it. 
each representing a shared pair of electrons. So double bond, triple bond, and of course you can have single bonds as well, of course. So <clears throat> that's um, our structure. Let's address this point because this is a classic, classic, classic GCC question. Why do covalent molecules have low boiling points? And what every year majority of people have to write, they say, oh, these are covalent bonds. Oh, it boils easily and therefore covalent bonds must be weak. No, they are not. They're actually really, really, really strong. Trying to break those two nitrogens apart would be incredibly difficult. So that is definitely not the answer. So why do they have low boiling points? You gotta remember there is another type of force involved with this. So hopefully something you've heard of before. If not, we'll cover it now. So over here I've got another little picture. So I've got four different nitrogen molecules. I call them molecules, remember, because they are more than one atom. So two in this case. So four of my nitrogen molecules. So in reality, in the air around me, there'd be a, again an uncountably large number of these, all whizzing about bumping into each other. Okay. So in order to boil this, what you've got to do, so remember this has already boiled here. To get this down to a liquid, you've got to go really, really cold and to solid, ridiculously cold. So if we imagine, why are these things able to just fly away from each other? So the covalent bond is just holding two atoms together to make one molecule. We're not having to break that. There is another force that exists between all particles, okay? Between molecules. But what is the name of that force? Well, what it does tells you the name. It's between, the way you say the word between is inter. So inter means between things. These are molecules. So inter molecular molecules forces. So intermolecular forces exist between all molecules. They are really quite weak, which is why at room temperature, they are not strong enough to hold those nitrogens together. Therefore, nitrogen has already boiled into the gas. If you get this cold enough, then at some point, those forces will be strong enough to hold it together as a liquid. And if you go colder still, they'll be able to hold together as a solid. So if you ever get this question, and it's highly, highly likely, why do the covalent bonds have low boiling points? It's because it's nothing to do with the covalent bond. The covalent bond is strong, we're not breaking that. It's because in order to boil that, all we have to do is overcome intermolecular forces. Because intermolecular forces are weak, they require only a relatively small amount of energy to overcome, and therefore they break at quite a low temperature. And that is an answer to a classic, classic, classic question. Right, we've done malic, we've done covalent, we're not doing giant covalent, we've just got to look at metals. Our final type of bonding, we're almost there. So, metals and metallic bonding. So, Properties of metals, you all know some metals. So here I'm up two lumps of steel, I think. Um, nice thing about metallic bonding is it's the same rules apply. It doesn't matter what the metal is or a mixture of metals, the actual bonding or the mechanism that holds it together would be the same. Okay, so properties of metals, hopefully we know these. We know that metals are strong. We know they have high melting points. They are very definitely solids and will stay solids up to fairly high temperatures. There are some exceptions, but uh, mercury being the obvious one, um, but majority of them very high melting points. We know they're good conductors of electricity, so we make electrical circuits out of metal wires, don't we, often copper. Um, they're also very good conductors of heat. So uh, saucepans have, are made of metal, so when you put them on the flame, the heat goes through very easily to cook your food. And the last word there, I'll just say in there, it's a less important one, but because it's fun, they are sonorous. Metals make a nice ringing noise. So if you do this, you've got, yeah, the world's worst percussion band. Um, great, well done the Scots. So, Let's explain the properties by thinking about its structure. So, thinking of the structure of a metal, the diagram you kind of want to have in your head is this, which might look a bit confusing and scribbly. Let me try and explain it to you. So, what happens in your metals? All the atoms are nicely lined up in a really highly ordered structure. Okay, so think of layers stacked upon each other. Okay, oh, just remind me actually, I missed off a really important property malleable. Opposite of brittle. So, remember, iron complement of brittle. Malleable, I don't know why I've written that in blue, but M-A-L-L-E-A-B-L-E, -L -L -E, malleable, uh, means that they will bend. So if you take a metal, obviously you have to be very strong, but metals, if you apply enough force, they will bend rather than snap, and then they will stay in that structure still very strong, which is why metals are very useful when you make a car body. You obviously need to be able to shape it, and you still need to be strong. If you made it out of something that was brittle, it would snap. So metals are always malleable. Okay, back to our diagram. So we've got these... Uh, atoms all lined up. Now I'm going to stop calling them atoms and I'm going to start calling them ions because what happens in metallic bonding, 
the metal allows its outer electrons to just flow across the whole material. So it, you know, rather than being stuck in its fixed orbit around that one particular atom, the outer shell electrons are shared across the whole structure. Okay, What we call that, you can use two words, you can just find delocalized, i.e. they're no longer stuck to the local atom, they're shared across the whole thing, or you can refer to it as a sea of electrons. So whichever you prefer, doesn't matter. Key thing is though, you've got your highly ordered structure of metal ions surrounded by delocalized electrons or a sea of electrons. Okay, let's now use this to explain our properties. So strong and high mounting points, that must tell us something about the strength of attraction. So importantly, what holds metals together? There is a strong attraction between the metal ions, remember they're charged now because they let their electrons go, they're positive, and this whole sea of negative electrons. Uh, one analogy I had, it's a bit like, imagine like cube balls, um, played snooker, so snooker balls on the table, and then you stuck them all in glue. The glue might be your sea of electrons and the balls are your metal ions, and it's the attraction to that sea of, sea of electrons, or in this case, the glue surrounding them that holds them together. So, the attraction, and we're going to call it electrostatic again, an electrostatic force, in plus and minus, between the metal ions and the sea of electrons is very, very strong. Therefore, to pull them apart, either physically or by vibration with temperature, is very difficult. Hence, strong high melting points. Okay, why are they good conductors? To conduct, you need charged particles that can move. If we look at this picture, the metal ions are stuck in place, but the electrons are constantly whizzing across the whole structure. Therefore, if you apply a central difference of voltage, they will flow in the direction you want. Flow of charge, that's electricity. So they're good conductors because you've got free flowing electrons, a sea of electrons. Um, why are they good conductors of heat? Well, look to the electrons again. Two reasons really. If you heat up a piece of metal, because the particles are close together, if one starts to vibrate, because all heat really is, is vibration, it will nudge its neighbour and so on and so on and so on, and so they will therefore conduct quite well because of that. That's true of most solids though. Why are metals better than all other solids? Well, to do with these little electrons again, because they are moving, if you heat them up, those electrons gain more energy, they can move faster, and what they will do, because they now whiz around faster, they will again help spread that energy through the material. So if you heat at this end of it, the electrons here will move faster, move through the material, taking the energy with them. So they're good um, conductors of heat because closely packed structure and free electrons can carry that energy through the structure. Um, we're not going to talk about sonorous, less important, but we are going to talk about malleable. Why are they malleable? Now think of this diagram. In a way, it looks a bit like our ionic diagram because we've, we've got these close packed structures. But in this case, rather than pluses and minuses, sort of alternative, we've got all our pluses in lines and we've got our electrons all around it. If you apply force to this, so imagine that top layer gets pushed along. So you apply a force and slide it apart. Unlike an ionic compound where you now have pluses and minuses trying to push apart, you can slide that layer because the electrons can move, they just move with the structure and you will still have a situation where you've got the pluses being held in place by the sea of electrons. Therefore, metals, the reason that they are malleable is if you apply a force, the layers can slide, the sea of electrons just reconfigures to that new shape and it's still just as strong as it was before, which is why you can shape metals and they're still really strong in their new shape. So, we've covered metals. I think we've covered all three bonding now. I know that was a long video, guys. Um, I'm probably going to set you some exam questions because there are so many questions uh, about bonding. And of all the things in chemistry, if you can understand why it is that atoms stick together and why that gives them the properties that they have, then that underpins a vast amount of the course. So probably all the things in chemistry you really need to get your head around, bonding is probably the most important. So have a lovely day, guys. I'll see you soon. Bye.